it like? When you start off with crawling and then like the experience is over, you get all into a cave? Yes, like, correct. Elena, you're getting to it, which means this entire thing is what? Like no. A metaphor. Thank you. That's why I was referring to your status as English students. It's a metaphor. It's figurative language. And Oedipus is the only person to see it as not literal. Everybody else saw it as literal. So they're all thinking, what strange beast transforms itself somehow in the middle of the day to have more legs in the morning and in the afternoon? They're all driving themselves crazy trying to figure out some sort of mythological beast that they can name. And Oedipus sees it simply because he's able to see it on a different level. He's very insightful and very critical. So the answer is man. And there we go, as Elena was saying. He crawls as an infant in the beginning of his life, walks upright as an adult in the prime of his life, and uses a cane as an old man. And there is your third leg. <laughs> the Sphinx as a reaction to her riddle being solved, throws herself off a cliff and dies. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> so the Sphinx is gone. Oedipus is savior of the city. He has defeated this horrible beast. And yea, Ra, the Thebans make Oedipus their king in gratitude. Well, their, their king's gone. There's this power vacuum. And Oedipus, by solving this riddle, has demonstrated himself to be enormously insightful godlike in his uh, intuitive powers. So they say, hey, you can be king. That means that Oedipus has not necessarily supplanted, but definitely jumped in front of Creon, who is the brother-in-law of Laios. And I'll let you figure out the relationship to Oedipus in a moment. But he's the brother-in-law to Elias, and he would be next in line for the throne as the, the next direct male in line. So he jumps in front of Creon, and he receives the hand of the current queen, Jocasta, in marriage. So he marries Jocasta. She is queen. She is now his queen. But of course, we all know her as mom. Yes. That's right. He's killed dad. He's married mom. And oh, they have four children. And I love the look on Aaron's face right there when I revealed that one. <laughs> we have four kids of Oedipus and Jocasta, those being Antigone, Ismene, Ateocles, and Polynices. The house, uh, the, ha the house of Cadmus, the house of Cadmus, which is the ancient, um, uh, why am I lacking the word, uh, the ancient father of the house, um, is cursed. And this curse outlasts Oedipus. His children eventually feel this curse. And in subsequent plays by Sophocles, you learn of how Polynices and Ateocles, in a violent struggle over the throne, kill each other. Um, Antigone kills herself when she rebels against the state on a matter of conscience. And Ismene is just kind of weak willed and just sort of lives out her life pathetically. Sharazad? I was just going to ask, doesn't Antigone have her own tragedy that was born? Yes. Antigone is the third of the three Oedipus plays. So after Oedipus' death, Oedipus doesn't die until the second one, Oedipus at Colonus. And then Antigone is the, some might say, tragic heroine of her own play, which is called Antigone. Wonderful play also. If we have, if usually, not usually, but sometimes, uh, if there's enough time, we read them both. But we'll just read Oedipus this year. So yes, Sarah. OK, from what I understand, and I'm not a biology teacher, I understand that the probability of genetic defects and other sorts of problems increases, but not its certainty. So that doesn't mean that they'll be born with five eyes and two heads and an extra pinky. <laughs> um, but I, I know, for instance, hemophilia is more likely to be transmitted with uh, close family relations. Um, 
which is why it's called the royal disease, because the royal families would inbreed. Elena? Okay, the, the mutilated feet were not badly enough mutilated to cripple Oedipus, um, but they were badly enough mutilated that it was an obvious mark for him, something that stayed with him throughout his entire life. And did anybody find out what Oedipus means? Swollen, Swollen feet. So he was actually named after the disfiguring of his feet. This is important because as you read through the play, you'll see Sophocles making references to feet and running. And those references are ironic references to Oedipus. Emily? Joe Costa does not know because she did not name him Oedipus. So it's not like he suddenly. Um, but once again, it's not as obvious. It's, it's not a huge disfigurement. She's like, oh my gosh, I did that. And besides, it would be 15, 18 years prior. So I'm certain that after that time, the healing and other process would make it such that she didn't recognize. That's what the play's all about. The play's all about revelation and learning the truth. But right now, we don't have that. So right now, what we have is Oedipus ruling in peace over Thebes for 20 years with Jocasta as his wife, fathering four children. And the people love him. And they are very grateful that he has saved them from the monstrous Sphinx. And they're very grateful that he serves as a be benevolent dictator. However, just before the play starts, the city is ravaged with disease. <laughs> People are dying left and right. They can't grow crops. They're starving. They are suffering to an extreme. And it is this suffering which opens the play, Oedipus Rex. So Oedipus emerges onto the stage considering the problem and what to do about it. What he does not know is that this problem is an expression of the God's anger that a murderer has been let to live, that this travesty, this blasphemy of this inbred marriage and the children that come from it has been allowed to exist. So the gods are punishing Thebes for this travesty. Austin. That's an excellent question. Why, why wait so long? Why not just you know, the the day after the honeymoon suddenly strike them down? That's correct. Um, right. To get really bad, you've got to have four. Well, true. However, Greek gods uh, bear a lot of similarity to us, so I think that Austin's question is um, relevant. But I, Austin, I honestly don't have an answer for you. Um, it's dramatically more effective, but that doesn't make sense in a religious sense. Right, Amy. It's entirely possible, and I understand where you're coming from. However, your response to that believes that there is a way out. See, that's the problem. Um, the people who believe there is a way out often suffer and see themselves destroyed. The people who submit themselves to the will of the gods are the ones who may still suffer, but they suffer a little bit more easily, possibly. They don't go through all this, this rigmarole and this problem. Uh, yeah. Um, there is a heavy stroke of determination that what you do is not necessarily free choice, but a revelation of what the gods want for you. Any further questions?